Hi, my name is Jason Haheim, and I'm principal timpanist of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra in New York City. As I mentioned in part one, I'd ordinarily be playing many hours of long operas at this point in the season. But since the coronavirus pandemic has indefinitely shut down the Met, I'm incredibly grateful to get to play several months of guest principal timpani with the fantastic Soul Philharmonic instead. In part one, we talked about the hierarchical elements of musicianship through the lens of Beethoven 7. In part two, we're going to get into Strauss Burlesque and Schumann New England Triptych. But before we get into those excerpts, I want to touch on one of the most important discoveries I made during my own time auditioning. Let's start with one reality. Every instrumental musician will take auditions, lots of them. Whether it's for youth orchestras, summer festivals, colleges and conservatories, juries, recitals, master's programs, or finally, full professional orchestra auditions, you will be taking a lot of auditions. It's absolutely guaranteed. So, you'll need to get good at auditioning. And even though the act of playing a solo audition in a quiet room, usually behind a screen, feels a lot different from performing in a full ensemble of 80 to 100 other live human musicians, the processes of each are actually testing the same things. Meticulous attention to detail methodical preparation, an informed artistic sensibility, a passionate devotion to the art form, exceptional persistence, an obsession with continuous refinement, and finally, an ability to demonstrate all of that under intense pressure. So, becoming a better auditioner will inevitably make you a better performer and a better musician overall, if you let it. Why do I frame it that way? Because some people don't let it. Some people view auditioning as a miserable, horrible, stressful process. But it doesn't have to be that way. I took a different approach. I didn't know I would end up taking exactly 28 auditions. But I knew it would be a lot. And by definition, I knew that I would lose most of them. Virtually every orchestral player you ever meet will have lost far more auditions than they've won. So the process of auditioning requires you to develop a very healthy relationship with failure. Or, put another way, the process of auditioning requires you to reframe failure as constructive growth. I took to heart the fundamental idea of continuous improvement and viewing each audition as a chance to improve and learn, essentially losing constructively. I eventually came to view myself as a tenacious loser with a healthy philosophy. Now, to be clear, I wasn't trying to fail. I very much was trying to win. I was just acknowledging that it might not happen. Because in an audition, there are a lot of factors that are simply beyond your control. So it was critical for me to fundamentally reorient my mindset Rather than focusing on individual auditions or discrete outcomes, I instead focused on what I could control, my own preparation process. Thus, while it was my goal 
to ultimately win an audition. My supporting goal, which was actually more important, was to have the best practicing and preparation process possible. In the long run, I think that's a much healthier way for anyone and everyone to pursue the process of auditioning. Now, one critical element of my process became self-recording. I mentioned this in part one, but it deserves a fuller explanation here. In part one, I noted that many listeners will be tapping along as you play. Now, you can do that for yourself too. One of the absolutely game-changing things for my development as a musician was buying a dedicated self-recording device like this Zoom H4 and using it every single day. Recording yourself and listening back is uncomfortable at first. It can be awkward and difficult to have the reality of how you sound revealed in such an unflinching and objective way. But here's the thing, that's how you sound. That's how other people will hear you. So better start sooner than later in terms of reckoning with it. In part one, I noted that deliberate practice is the scientific method applied to the craft of music making. One of the most essential attributes of deliberate practice is continuous feedback. And we can generate that for ourselves via self-recording. So, just like scientists gather feedback by running experiments, we musicians gather feedback by recording ourselves, playing for teachers, and playing for mock audition committees. Recording yourself is also a way to immediately draw your ear to the most important priorities on your pyramid structure. Again, you may think it has to do with your tone or your phrasing, but in listening back to yourself, you realize you're constantly rushing or you're playing unevenly. Self-recording is an essential tool for establishing meaningful priorities. Now there's another benefit to self-recording as well. Training yourself to toggle between performance mode and analysis mode. These two things almost never go well together. When you're performing at your best, you're likely very focused, present, in the moment, with minimal mental chatter or inner monologue distracting you. By contrast, problem solving and analysis is all about an inner monologue. Luckily, the self-recorder lets you separate these tasks. When you're performing, you can focus on performing. Essentially, outsourcing the necessary analysis and scrutiny to your future brain when you'll be listening back. Not only is this a much more fruitful practice room workflow, it trains you for a better life as a performer as well. It cultivates existing in the moment as a more permanent state of performance without getting needlessly distracted and without engaging in self-destructive, negative self-talk. Finally, the self-recording shouldn't end in the practice room. By all means, you should record all of your mock auditions and your regular auditions and especially your lessons. There's far too much valuable information in all of those to let it evaporate undocumented. As stated in part one, my goal with these classes is to give you a framework to get started. For context, here then is Strauss Burlesque with full orchestra. Mm -hmm. 
Quite the opening of a work, right? It's a very cool timpani feature. And the rest of the work features many other compelling interjections from the timpani. Again, don't forget to study the other askable spots and familiarize yourself with the entire work. For now, though, we're focusing on the opening. Now that you've heard the full orchestra playing this section, Let's hear the timpani excerpt in isolation. So already, we see that we are in a much different vein than Beethoven 7. Different style, different challenges, and different sounds. What remains the same, though, is the importance of fundamentals to build the full picture of our excerpt. As before, we're going to step through the challenges of burlesque one pyramid element at a time. As before, we'll begin with intonation. Burlesque provides a slightly different challenge than Beethoven 7, since we're now using all four drums. In Beethoven, if we started out of tune, all we needed to do was move our right foot quick to reestablish the perfect fifth. Here, however, we only have two feet for four drums. It's still possible to correct while you're playing, just more difficult. So this points to the necessity of starting in tune. How do we best accomplish this? Timpanists need to spend a great deal of time developing their ear via ear training exercises to develop excellent relative pitch. Ideally, this lets you know where any other note is given one reference pitch. Now, our common reference pitch is A, and it's essential that you have at least an A tuning fork with your timpani gear at all times. When it comes to actually tuning the timpani, before you begin, it's all about being careful, methodical, and not second-guessing yourself too much. Tap the tuning fork on your wrist or knee to get it vibrating, and then hold it up to your ear, pressing the butt end into your jawbone just in front of your ear. This physical contact causes the pitch to resonate within your skull cavity, making it much louder and more useful to use as a reference pitch. With the fork still vibrating, Lean down and get your head as close as possible to the drum. Nose nearly touching the head with both ears the same distance from the head, roughly over the playing area. We do it this way so that we can tune quietly and unobtrusively, since excessively loud tuning can get you cut from an audition or can get you baffled stares from your colleagues in the middle of an orchestra performance. Disengage the ratchet and Paul pedal to bring the drum to a low pitch. Now, gently resting your other hand on the counter hoop, very lightly tap the head as you're moving the pedal to higher tension, listening carefully for the drum to get to your intended note. Tap only once or twice more as you fine-tune the position of the pedal. Now with a ratchet and Paul timpani system, you may need to adjust the fine-tuner at this point to get 
in between the pitch intervals allowed by the tee. For burlesque then, you repeat this process for the remaining three drums, establishing notes that will form a D minor triad with the addition of an E on the 26. Next, we'll cover time and rhythm. As discussed with Beethoven 7, it's always advisable to establish a target tempo for yourself. Mine is dotted half note equals 63 for burlesque. Burlesque also introduces a new variable, long rests. Many, many players will rush through the rests in a solo audition, so don't let yourself become one of those casualties. I find it helpful to sing the orchestra part in my head during the rests in order to keep strict time while also subdividing quarter notes. In terms of the rhythms, make sure to keep the eighth notes very precise so, not too clipped, too short, and not too swingy. It's too wide. This is yet another instance when it's really helpful to subdivide by tapping while you're listening back to your own recording. The next major issue is clarity where again, we have some different challenges than Beethoven 7. In Beethoven 7, we only had A and E to worry about. The lower pitches will usually need to be balanced up higher dynamically, since the higher pitches will tend to project more. With burlesque, that challenge is all the more acute. Across these four drums and this constantly moving melody, it can be very easy for certain notes to get lost, to not fully articulate, to be muffled, ghosted, or not speak. Knowing that this is an essential priority for this excerpt, especially in order to ultimately craft a compelling phrase with a smooth line, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to best achieve this kind of clarity from a technical perspective. This leads to another important issue of timpani playing, physical efficiency. The field of biomechanics is the study of human movement, and more specifically, the study of efficient human movement. You'll often find biomechanical analyses of Olympic athletes looking to squeeze just a little more out of their discus throw or their high jump. Applied to burlesque, I was searching for ways to increase my own efficiency of movement. This ties in with another one of my mantras of good timpani technique. Eliminate extraneous motion. Extraneous motion will almost always introduce negative downstream consequences. And so this is another area where scrutinizing yourself through video self-recording can yield huge dividends. Beginning timpanists are taught to play the drum in the normal playing areas. This is often useful and advisable, but it's not set in stone. Burlesque is an excerpt where I choose to employ adjacent beating spots. This dramatically increases my efficiency of motion because it significantly decreases the total lateral transit distance my sticks make. For comparison, here's what burlesque looks like with normal beating spots. And now, here's what burlesque looks like with adjacent beating spots. That's a lot easier, right? Way less moving around. It fully supports my mantra to remove extraneous motion. In so doing, it becomes far easier to control your clarity, your evenness, 
and your dynamics in order to ultimately create a good phrase. Now that we've established easy lateral movement to control evenness, it's traditional to craft a subtle hairpin that emphasizes the tension in the line. Again, the key is to be relatively subtle. This is too much. Well, this is maybe not enough. You'll want to explore these extremes so you can find the middle zone that feels just right. The second section of this excerpt dramatically changes dynamic levels. It also brings up another major issue of this excerpt, muffling. For the record, we need to state something categorically. Due to the idiosyncrasies of the evolution of percussion and timpani orchestration and composer's use thereof, printed note lengths in timpani parts are meaningless. To repeat, printed note lengths in timpani parts are meaningless. Just because it says quarter note doesn't necessarily mean you play it short for only a quarter note duration. Sometimes you do, but sometimes you let it ring. And how you make this decision must depend on the musical context, which again is all the more reason why score study is critical. This fortissimo highlights several of the reasons timpanists will need to employ muffling. First, a call and response dynamic with the orchestra, where you need to get out of the way so they can be heard clearly. And adjacent pitches like D, E, and F, which will ring dissonantly together and muddy the impression of the line. In slow motion then, this is how I advocate executing the muffling of this passage. Again, in terms of timpani tone, we're in a totally different sound world from Beethoven 7. This is a legitimate timpani solo, and so we can definitely go for a softer, darker, warmer, more interesting solo statement kind of sound while still being clear enough so that the line doesn't get too mushy. Here, I'm using a stick of my own design with a custom core and a medium amount of German felt, tightly wrapped cartwheel style. Another interesting requirement in terms of tone is due to the placement of the pitches. The notes are quite high in the ranges of the drums, especially the A on the 32 and the D on the 29. This means that all other things being equal, these notes will get pingier since the high tension of the head will make the stick rebound more quickly. To counteract this, you'll need to choose a somewhat heavier mallet. A good general rule is tight heads, heavier sticks, slack heads, lighter sticks. Finally, you'll need a mallet that sounds clear at soft dynamics without getting too harsh or abrasive at the explosive fortissimo dynamics. My stick accomplishes this rather well, if I do say so myself. Again, this is where it all comes together, at the top of the pyramid. Your personality, your style, the X factor that distinguishes you from all of the other auditioners. Strauss was a masterful timpani orchestrator, and the fact that he chooses to give the opening passage of this piano timpani concerto to the timpani 
is more evidence of his creative implementation ideas. Your two solo statements should exist in stark contrast to the following fortissimo. Those should be dramatic, shocking, and exciting. When you add all of this together, well-tuned drums, precise rhythms, and not rushing rests, a clear, well-phrased line with a well-chosen mallet that sounds good in these contrasting piano and fortissimo sections, you get this. Finally, even though it's a totally different excerpt by a totally different composer, I think it's worth noting another commonly asked timpani excerpt where you can employ similar strategies, adjacent beating spots for William Schumann's New England triptych. Like the burlesque, this piece opens with solo timpani. Also like the burlesque, this solo timpani passage requires calm and dexterous control moving laterally between the instruments to create a seamless solo line. You can see the same idea operating this way. Thanks for sticking with me through part two. While this is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of approaching timpani excerpts and timpani auditions, I hope I've at least provided a starting point to help you structure your practice and audition planning. For more on all of this, please feel free to visit my website, jasonhaheim.com. Thanks again, and good luck with your auditioning.